of their searching. You see, where the pursuit of God and the searching of mankind collide, there is Jesus. The bridge to the one true God, Jesus. The beginning and the end, Jesus. The perfect example of perfect love, Jesus. The one who loves us in spite of our failures, takes our worst and gives us his best, Jesus. The way, the truth, and the life, the one who broke the chains of our sin, the one who has the power to heal and restore, the one who defeated death and rose victorious on the third day, Jesus. No other name is higher, no other name is greater, no other name than the one we celebrate today, Jesus. Amen, 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 and welcome in everybody. Today we're really going to be talking about the nature of man, or, or what is the nature of of man amen and we're really going to dig into this so that we can get an understanding so we can understand everything that's taking place in the salvation process now i had taught on soteriology so I had taught on soteriology, so I'm going to continue with that teaching because soteriology is really understanding your salvation. And in order to understand your salvation, you really got to understand the nature of man. Amen. So man's physical nature consists of two essential elements. So there's two essential elements to the nature of man. The first is the dust of the ground, and the second is the breath of of life. So the combination of the dust of the ground and the breath of of life results in what? It results in a living soul or a person. And you're going to see that in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 it says and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. So what we see here is the historical record of God's formation of man and it provides the key to understanding of man's physical nature so in order to understand man's physical nature we really really got to understand what the bible's saying amen can we agree on that this morning so when we look at what it says it says and the lord god formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So we have the dust of the ground. So we know that man is really made of the dust of the ground. So God said unto Adam, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shall thou return that comes from genesis chapter 3 verse 19 now the phrase the dust of the ground refers to the chemical elements the chemical elements that constitute man's body so when we we, we see this god has made that all things by using various combinations of approximately 100 basic ingredients that men have named chemical elements now if you look at the, the the chemical breakdown of an individual when we really get into this if you look at the breakdown of the chemical analysis of a man's body it reveals that it consists of 72 parts of oxygen 13.5 parts carbon 9.1 parts hydrogen 2.5 parts of nitrogen 1.3 parts calcium, 1.15 parts of phosphorus, and small amounts of potassium, sulfur, sodium, chlorine, magnesium, iron, silicon, iodine, and fluorine. Now, the first six elements that I just said, therefore, make up the 99% of a man's body. So oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, and phosphorus make up 99% of your body, okay? So these chemical elements are found in soil in various compounds. They're absorbed into plants where through chemical action or chemical reaction, they're prepared to be assimilated into the man's body. 
And the way that it's assimilated into the man's body is when man eats food, some of these elements become incorporated into his physical nature. Now, after, um, after death, man's body really decomposes and the chemical elements return to the earth. You'll see that in Genesis 3.19. It says, dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Man shall turn again unto dust. You'll see that in Job chapter 34, verse 15. Job 34, 15, you're going to see that man shall turn again unto dust. Psalm 146, 4 says, His breath goeth forth, he returneth to the earth. Psalm 104, 29 says, Thou takest away their breath, they die and return to their dust. Ecclesiastes 3, 3, 20 says all go unto one place all are of the dust and all turn to dust again ecclesiastes 12 7 says then shall the dust return to the earth as it was so we see that it's very important that when god said from the dust of the earth i form man we really got to understand what are these elements and what is he talking about because throughout scripture we see that man will return back to this dust so man was created by god bringing all these compounds together into one single being so he took all these compounds and he combined them and then breathed into their nostrils and they became what a living soul so we see the creation of man amen the creation of man so the dust formed was an in an inanimate until he received the breath from god and when he received the breath from god he became a living soul and, and we see in the scripture it says and the lord god breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul so the breath of life here is the vital force which enables man's body to function and the remarkable working of man's brain and nervous system are possible only because this divinely given vital force is constantly present in his body now the english bible <clears throat> the English Bible sometimes refers to man's breath of life as his spirit. Man's spirit is his breath of life. So spirit is translated from the Hebrew word ruach and the Hebrew word neshama. And it comes from the Greek word pneuma. Okay. So pneuma is in Greek what ruach is in Hebrew. So spirit means air. It means breath, it means wind, it means power, it means animation, it means the manifestation of one's power. And the English word pneumonia and pneumatic are derived from the Greek word pneuma. Now you guys will remember if you've been listening that I have taught on pneumatology, right? And pneumatology is the study of the Holy Spirit or the movement of God's Spirit, amen? So the Holy Spirit is the acting force in the earth, amen? So this is where pneuma comes in. This is where we get the power tools, pneumatic tools, right? Pneumatic tools are air-powered tools. It's power. It's tools that are powered by a compressed air. It's also where we get the word pneumonia from, right? Because it's an infection in the lungs. So we see here that it's derived from that word, and man receives his breath of life, or spirit from God's power, the Holy Spirit, which we'll see in Job 33, 4 and 27, 3. Okay. Now, animals, animals also have breath of life. Genesis 7, verse 21 and 22. If you want to look at that, Genesis 7, 21 and 22, you'll see that even animals have the breath of life. So if you go to Genesis 7, 21 and 22, it says this. It says, every living thing that moved on land perished, birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that sworn over the earth, and all mankind. Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Hold up. So it says that everything on dry land 
that had the breath of life. So now we're seeing that the, the breath that is in us, the soul that is in us, right? We became a living soul. That is the breath of life that's in you. That is not your spirit. That is the life from the creator. That was the life that was given to you. Amen. So we see that animals, everything on the earth had the breath of life and its nostrils and that it died here. Amen. So we see that every living creature has the breath of life in it. Animals breath is the same as man's. Animals breath of life is the same as man's. Go to Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 19. Ecclesiastes 3, and we're going to look at verse 19. It says, Surely the fate of human beings is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Humans have no advantage over animals. Everything is is meaningless. So we see here that animals have the same breath as the human does. Amen. So when somebody says that when God breathed into them, they be breathed the spirit into them, that's incorrect. He breathed the breath of life into them. Now at death, man's breath of life returns to its giver. At death, man's breath of life returns to its giver. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And we're going to look at verse 7. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7. It says, And the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. And dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Look at Job chapter 34. Go to Job 34. Job 34. And look at um, Job 34 and look at verses um, 14 and 15. Job 34 verses 14 and 15. It says, if it were his intention and he withdrew his spirit and breath. Now watch. If it were his intention and he withdrew his spirit and breath, all humanity would perish together and mankind would return to the dust. Amen. So man's breath of life is not a being or an entity itself. Let me repeat that. Man's breath of life is not a being or an entity in itself. What it does is it enables man's mind to work, but it does not possess a mind independent of man's brain. The breath of life causes the brain and nervous system to function, but it has no ability to think, to feel, or to will in itself. The breath of life is not something that has a consciousness apart from man's body. The breath of life leaves man's body at death. His breath goeth forth. He returneth to his earth. And that very day, his thoughts perish. So let me tell you something, because I hear a lot of times, <clears throat> and a lot of people say this, a lot of pastors say this, and they're just trying to make you feel better about the situation. They're like, well... Your loved one's looking down on you from heaven. Your loved one can see you. Your loved one's praying for you while they're in heaven. The loved one's interceding for you. Let me tell you something. The Bible says in Psalm 146, 4, it says that his breath goeth forth. He returneth to the earth in that very day. His thoughts perish. If you look in the New Testament, Jesus said what? Let the dead bury the dead. Let the dead bury the dead. We've got to start to understand that when we're looking at this, 
When we're focused on this, when we're allowing the word of God to speak what the word of God has for each and every one of us, what we start to see is that the truth lies in scriptures. So when the spirit leaves man's body, it continues to be the impersonal, unconscious power of God that causes man to live. Man's brain and his nervous system are part of man's body and they're buried in the grave and returned to the earth. When the breath of life has left man's body, man is dead. And I'm here to tell you today that man cannot preach. Man cannot talk. Man cannot do anything when he's dead. The dead cannot speak. The dead cannot come and visit you. The dead cannot show up in your room. The dead can't say, you know what? I'm going to go visit my grandson or my granddaughter. I'm going to go visit my brothers or my sisters. I hear so many people say, well, my grandma, my grandpa, my mom, my dad, I, I seen them. They came back. No, they didn't. They're dead. I'm sorry. They're dead. The breath of life has returned to the giver and the body has been returned to the dust. When the spirit leaves man's body, it continues to be the impersonal, unconscious power of God that causes man to live. Your brain and your nervous system are part of your body and they're buried in the grave and they return to the earth. When the breath of life has left your body, you're dead. You're dead. It's over. There's no, there's no other way to see it, but it's over. When his brain and nervous system are separated from that power of life, which cause them to function, man becomes unconscious. Man loses his ability to comprehend. In that very day that the breath is withdrawn from you, your thoughts perish. Your thoughts perish. You see, man, man's dust-formed body, animated by the breath of life, constituted a living soul. Look at what Genesis 2-7 says. It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils and the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The word soul in this verse means creature or being. It means creature or being. So when we see that man became a living soul, now we're starting to see how in the New Testament, what's taking place when you are born again, you become what? A new creation in Christ. So that soul that you originally were now dies off and you become a new creation or a new soul in Christ. Amen. So to say that a person is a soul is to say that he's a creature. In other words, Adam became a living creature. Pastor Nate became a living creature. The existence of the living creature required the union of the dust-formed body and the breath of life. The creation equation is as follows. The dust-formed body plus the breath of life equaled a living soul or a living creature. Before Adam received the breath of life, he was an inanimate soul. He was an inanimate soul or an inanimate creature, meaning he had no movement. He had no, he had no life in him. 
When he died and the breath of life left his body, he became a dead soul or a dead creature. <clears throat> the meaning of the word soul, the word translated soul in the Bible means primary life and secondarily creatures that possess that life. Animals designated as souls. So the Hebrew and Greek word translated souls are applied to animals as well as men. These words refer to life possessed by both men and animals. And there, there's several verses that show you this. It's, it's Genesis 1.20, Genesis 21, Genesis 24, Genesis 2.19, um, Leviticus 11.46, Proverbs 12.10, Revelation 8.9, Revelation 16.3. You see, because man the soul is immortal. Did you guys catch that? Man the soul is mortal. Man's soul is mortal. The soul is never mentioned in the Bible as being immortal. It's never mentioned as being undying. It's never mentioned as being eternal. The soul is mortal. It is subject to death. It is subject to destruction. It can be killed and it can die. The fact that the soul can die proves that it is not immortal. The doctrine of the immortality of the soul has no scriptural support. When Jesus said this, Jesus said, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? When Jesus said, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? He referred to the man's life. He was not referring to the soul in which you became. He was not referring to the inanimate creature that you became. He's asking you, what shall a man give in exchange for his life? You see, because Christ's soul was his life. Christ's soul died. He gave his life as a sacrifice. If you look at Isaiah 53, 10, it says, Thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Isaiah 53, 12 says, He hath poured out his soul unto death. Acts 2, 27 says, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. What this shows is that Christ did not have an immortal soul because if Jesus had been immortal, he could not have died. He who is immortal cannot die. Jesus poured out his soul or his life in death. He was unconscious in death until God raised him to immortality. Man's soul, therefore, refers to the man himself and to the life that he possesses. We know through studying Christology, we know by reading the word of God that Jesus was God. But we also know that Jesus was 100% man. The soul is an entity distinct from man himself. It has no conscious existence apart from the man's body. The soul is mortal. The soul, referring to man as a creature, goes to the grave at death. The soul can be utterly destroyed and will be destroyed in the second death if the person is a non-Christian. It will be observed that life was all that was added to man after his creation to make him a living soul or man, and consequently, all that was taken away at death, he was perfectly formed, having eyes, ears, a mouth, hands, feet, lungs, heart, arteries, veins, nerves, muscles, and a brain. But this wonderful formation that we have as man was in the likeness of his creator. 
And it was useless and helpless without what? Without the breath of life. It's sort of like this. If you have a water wheel or, or without water, or maybe you have a sailboat without wind, or you maybe you have a steamboat without steam. But no one calls the water a water wheel, the wind a sailing vessel, or the steam a steamship. When the water shut off from the wheel, we do not say the wheel is gone. When the wind closes, we do not say the ship is taken away. Nor when the steam is removed and the steamship is gone. So why then say the man has gone to his reward or punishment when only his life has been taken away? I've searched the word of God and searched the word of God and searched the word of God. And I've not been able to find any proof in the Bible, the facts of science, psychology, the eternal principles of pure reason or common sense to show anything else leaves of pure reason that leaves man at death but life expressed in Hebrew by the word nefesh, ruach, nahashima, and in the Greek word suke or zo and pneuma. There is nothing else that can describe life. You can attempt. You can try. But the only thing that gave you life was the breath of God. Man is a unity. We are unipersonal. God is tri-personal. We are uni-personal. Our physical nature is undivided and indivisible. The union of our body and breath of life forms one living unit. The living unit is a living person having a multiplicity of endowment. You possess many powers and abilities. You can do different things. You can think, you can feel, you can choose. You have a conscience and you possess a character. Your personality, however, is one undivided whole. So when people try to, to, to use our makeup as a description of the Trinity, it'll fail every time. Why? Because we are unipersonal and he is tripersonal. Man's mental nature and physical nature are not two separate entities. They're not two separate entities within the one body. They're linked together. They form two inseparable parts of one unit. Man's mental nature really is part of his physical nature. You can think yourself physically sick. You can think yourself physically sick. When you're depressed, your physical nature acts upon your mental nature. Are you guys with me? Your mental nature and your physical nature are not separate. You can't separate them. Your body can't sin without first your brain thinking about it. A thought has to come in in order for you to act upon it, to act it out. So if your brain says, hey, I'm not getting out of bed today, guess what? Your body's not going to get out of bed today. If your brain's saying, I don't want to do anything today, you're not going to go do anything today. If your brain's saying, I'm happy your body feels happy. If, you're, if your brain tells you your body's sad, your body kind of, it feels sluggish. It feels slow. It doesn't want to do anything. The, the mental part is acted out by the physical part, which we know as the body. So they're inseparable. They're linked together. Man's Man's mind results from the functioning of his brain. Without a brain, man cannot possess a mind. 
The brain is part of man's body, his physical nature. The thinking, the conscience part of man, therefore results from the functioning of the physical part of man. Man is a unit. This is why people say, I'm having a mental health day. What do they mean when they say, I'm having a mental health day? They're trying to tell you, hey, I'm either depressed, I'm having anxiety issues, something's going on in my mind, and it's acting out in the physical of who I am. So what's going on in your brain causes your body to act out what your brain is thinking. And that's because man is one unit. It's unified, right? It's unified. Your brain operates your movement. Your brain operates everything that you do. So you can't separate those two. Well, where are you getting that from? When someone is brain dead, what happens to their body? Their body stops functioning. When someone is brain dead... They go on to a ventilator to breathe for them. Their body has shut down because the brain is not telling the body to function. This is showing the unity of man. The Bible is very clear and it clearly teaches that the spirit in man's breath of life, the God-given vital force of life, the soul is man himself and the life he possesses. The word of God presents an abundant testimony that neither the spirit nor the soul is a conscience personality which can exist apart from the man's body. We've noticed that man is a unity, that no part of man continues to live after the man dies. All men are mortal and all of man is mortal. So what we see here what we see here is that once that breath of life is withdrawn, you're dead. Game over. There's no reset button. You can't start over here. Right? You can't start over here. But see, we move from the nature of man, which is the immortal, to immortality, Right? And Job, the ancient religious philosopher, asked, If a man dies, shall he live again? In Job 14 14. So to this question, three answers have been given. Two answers are false, and one answer is true. Atheism's answer is that man will never live again. That when you die, you die, it's over. That was the end of it. You'll never see life again. So they say when man dies, according to this theory, his existence is ended for all eternity. Because atheism, atheism denies the reality of God, the supernatural life of Jesus, and man's hope for eternal life. It asserts that there is no future life for any man. Then you move into paganism. And paganism's answer is that there is an immortal future life for all men. It declares that men naturally are immortal and cannot be destroyed. And all men, according to its teachings, must continue to live in some form and in some place throughout eternity. It asserts that there is an eternal future life for all men. But the Bible gives the real answer. The Bible gives the truth. The Bible gives the truth. The answers of atheism and paganism are incorrect. And the Bible's answer to Job's question is that all men will live again. But only those who meet God's requirement will be given immortality and eternal life. Men who fail to meet God's requirements will be raised to judgment in the final resurrection and then will be destroyed. The Bible teaches that men naturally are mortal. It asserts that future eternal life for man is conditional. So many people say that the work of the cross was unconditional. There's 18 of you in here. Who believes in here that the work of the cross was unconditional? Who in here thinks that the work of the cross was unconditional? I 
I see a yes, I see a no, I see another no. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, if you believe that the work of the cross was unconditional, you're sadly mistaken. Because there was a condition in order for you to receive that gift. Jesus' love, God's love is unconditional. For God so loved the world, right? His love was unconditional. For God so loved the whole world that he sent his only begotten son. Now watch the condition here. That whomsoever what? believeth on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So the, there was a condition here on that sacrifice. You had to accept, proclaim, and stand in that truth. So God's love was unconditional, but the gift had conditions upon it. Amen? Amen we see that there was a condition that had to be accepted. So atheism believes in no gods. Paganism believes in many gods. The Bible teaches the existence of one God. Atheism is the denial of the true. Paganism is the perversion of the true. The Bible is the revelation of the true. Atheism, uh, atheism believes in no immortality. Paganism believes in natural immortality, but the Bible teaches conditional immortality. Atheism explains all existence in terms of matter. It explains all existence in terms of matter. Whatever can, cannot be perceived by man's physical senses is declared not to exist. God's existence, the Bible's inspiration, man's future life are all denied, according to atheists. When we look at what they believe, they believe man's candle of life is extinguished at death and will never be lighted again. Man's obituary, they say, forms the per permanent concluding chapter of his biography. They explain that man came out of darkness lives a few years in the sunlight, and then enters eternal darkness again. Atheism is doomed to ultimate failure. Men normally, men, men normally believe in God's existence. Atheism is abnormal. Atheism fights a losing battle. It travels the wrong way on a one-way street. But when men regain normalcy or when the calling of God comes upon them, they return to belief in the existence of God. I don't know how many atheists have come back to God because God had finally called them. See, so many people try to choose God and haven't been called. Then we had paganism, which was natural immor immoral immortality, natural immortality. And legends and myths of the pagan world are filled with accounts of what is imagined to happen to man after death. And paganism has really perverted the worship of God into idolatry and the truth of God into mythology. The truth that God created man with the desire for immortality has been perverted by paganism. God promised immortality to man if he met God's requirements. Having turned his back to the light, fallen man plunged into darkness, dwelling in paganism, and man continued to have a desire for immortality, but he forgot that God's promise of immortality is conditional. Pagans began to teach that all men naturally have immortality, and it insisted that death is not death at all, but the constitution of life in a new form and in a new place. And this has been formed into a philosophy by the pagan Greek Plato through the influence of his followers. Plato's doctrine of natural immortality entered the theology of some sections of Christ Christendom during the early centuries of the church age. There is Christians out here that believe that immortality is meant for all men. 
There's Christians out here that believe that all men will be saved. Now, I've talked about atheism, I've talked about paganism, but let's talk about the Bible for a moment. The Bible answers the false teaching of atheism by promoting immortality and future life to men properly related to Christ. These blessings are included in God's gift of salvation. They're going to be bestowed upon those in Christ when he returns. The Bible answers the perverted theology of paganism by teaching that man is mortal and at death ceases to live. That future life is dependent upon resurrection. And Christians will be resurrected to immortality and glory in the first resurrection. So many people say, well, there's only one resurrection. No, there's two resurrections. Read the scriptures. Because in Revelation, you're going to see the second resurrection when the sinners, when the non-believers will be resurrected to mortality and face judgment in the final resurrection. The Bible is the only authoritative source of information concerning man's future. You can go to self-help books. You can go read all them other books out there that you want to go read and nothing's going to lead you to Christ like the Bible does. Nothing's going to give you the correct answers like the Bible does. Nothing's going to give you direction in your life like the Bible does. The history of conditional immortality begins with the Bible. The men who wrote the books of the Bible taught consistently that man does not now have immortality. They revealed that man is totally mortal, that he's a dying creature, that, that immortality and eternal life are pictured in the Bible as gifts of God, which can be acquired only through Jesus Christ. And apart from Jesus, there's no hope of eternal life. Sin's going to result in death. The wicked will experience final destruction. Conditional immortality was the belief of the New Testament church. It was the original official orthodox teaching of the Christian religion. Any contrary belief has resulted as a departure from the truth of the word of God. In the Bible, God is compared to mountains which endure from generation to generation. And eternal life is compared to a river which flows on and on. Century after century. Man, however, is never compared to anything durable. His life is brief, it's transient, and it's momentary. He's subject to change, he's subject to suffering, and he's subject to death. If the mighty Pacific Ocean represented eternity... Man's present life would be merely as a grain of sand on a seashore. If man's, if the mighty Pacific Ocean represented the eternity, man's present life would be merely as a grain of sand on a seashore. Because man is mortal. Because man is subject to death. All men are mortal and all of man is mortal. Mortality is not only universal among men, but also total within man. No part of man is immortal. There's not one verse in the entire Bible that teaches that man or any part of man is immortal. The Bible constantly reveals that man is mortal. Job asked, shall mortal man be more just than God? In Job 4, 17, David wrote, what man is he that liveth and shall not see death? In Hebrews 9, 27, it says, it is appointed unto men once to die. The only person that is immortal is God. God is immortal. God alone is the original source of immortality. All creatures are subject to corruption, change, and decay. 
Men today are mortals. Believers will not receive immortality until the resurrection at Jesus' return. Did you know the word immortal occurs only one time in the entire Bible? The word immortal, immortal occurs only one time in the entire Bible. The word in the verse refers to God. And you'll find it in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. It says, Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul described the Creator as the incorruptible God in Romans chapter 1, verse 23. God is immortal. He can never die. When you look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16, we begin to see that God only hath immortality. God is the only one who has always had immortality. So we see that immortality originates with God. It can be received from him only through his son, Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right? So that life is the immortality, but that immortality does not come until the resurrection and until Jesus' return. You see, Jesus was born a mortal in the physical likeness of man. Do you guys understand that? That Jesus was 100% man, that he was mortal in the physical likeness of man. If Jesus had been immortal, he could not have died. If Jesus had been immortal, he could not have died. Because one who's immortal cannot die. But in his glorious resurrection, our Savior rose from the dead to what? To immortality. As Christians, we seek future immortality. Because we seek life after death. We seek that eternal place of God with God. We seek the everlasting. But today we're mortal. Today we're mortal. Today we face challenges. Today we face circumstances. Today we know that we're going to face death. There's no way around it. One thing guaranteed in life is death. Is it easy? No. Is it guaranteed? Absolutely. Why is it guaranteed? Because of the disobedience in the garden. Because of the disobedience in the garden... We now have to experience death. There was no death until the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. Everything was good. Everything was perfect. There was immortality in the garden until the fall of the disobedience. So immortality is one of the blessings promised through the gospel. Immortality is one of the blessings that's promised in the gospel. Today, Christians, by, by patient continuance and well-doing, seek for immortality. We'll see that in Romans chapter 2, verse 7. The fact that believers are seeking immortality is definite proof that they do not yet possess it. If men today already were immortal, there would be no need for them to seek out immortality but yet we see people seeking out what fountain of youth they're trying to do all these things to extend their life they're trying to make themselves immortal but they are not immortal for the man is mortal and will experience death the physical change the point of glorification will not occur until Christ returns. We'll see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I believe it's verse 33, where it says this corruptible must put on the incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. 
when man has experienced a change from mortality to immortality, he'll have a suitable physical nature for God's perfect eternity. For flesh and bone cannot inherit heaven. Are you guys with me? Am I going too deep? Or are you guys still with me? Immortality is not a natural possession of man. Immortality is not a natural possession of man. Through his grace and mercy, God has promised immortality to the believer as the crowning part of salvation. So in order to receive immortality, man must meet God's condition of what? Man must meet God's condition of salvation. So in order for you to put on immortality, you have to believe in what? You have to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You have to not only believe it, you have to receive it, believe it, and stand in it. Immortality and eternal life can be received only by believers who are properly related to God's Son. So now we're starting to see the power of adoption when it says that you are adopted into the family of God. That power of adoption makes you legally binding in the family of God. So you are legally bound into the family of God. That's what that word adoption means. It means that you've been taken from one nature or one family and placed into another nature or another family. This is where we get you are a new creation. And now we see the power of adoption. Amen. Christ was raised from death to immortality by the power of God and became the medium or the high priest through whom God will bestow immortality upon believers. Jesus became the authorized agent to give immortality and eternal life to men who meet God's requirements. Go with me to 1 John chapter 5, verse 11. 1 John chapter 5, verse 11. It says, God hath given us to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So we see here that immortality is granted through the Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only one that can give you immortality. If you believe in the Son, you have eternal life. If you don't believe in the Son, you don't have eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And those who reject God's Son reject the only door to eternal salvation. They reject the only opportunity they have to salvation. Now, I've talked a lot about coming to life through the, the breath of God, talking about the mortality of man, the immortality of man, but a lot of people get confused, and this is where I'm going to stop today after I talk about this, is what happens at death? There's so many people out there that want to give you these false hopes. But what happens at death? Because death is the termination of life. It's the end of conscious existence. Death and life are opposites. To die is to cease to live. And thou shalt die and not live. Isaiah 38, 1. In death, man's mind and body ceases to function. So what happens to man at death? Well, what happens to man at death is the opposite of what happened when God made man. We see in when God made man in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, it says from the dust of the earth, he then breathed into the nostrils and he became a living soul. So in creation, the breath of life was united with the dust made body and life resulted. In death, the breath of life is withdrawn the person dies and returns to the dust. Thou takest away their breath, they die and return to the dust. Psalm 104, 29. Dust plus breath equals a living person. 
This was the process of creation. Dust minus breath equals a dead person. This is the process of death. Psalm 104, 29 says, Takest away breath, return to the dust. Psalm 146, 4 says, Breath goeth forth, return to the earth. Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says, Dust return to earth, spirit returns to he who giveth. James 2, 26 says, Body without spirit is dead. The word spirit here in these verses refers to man's breath of life that returns to God who gave it. The breath of life is interpersonal. It is the vital power that enables man to live. There's a nature of man in death though. Because man is without conscience, existence, and death. He has no life. His brain and his nervous system cease to function. And without a brain, man cannot think. Without a nervous system, he cannot feel pain or pleasure. He cannot experience intellect, sensibilities, and will, will and can be exercised only when man's brain functions. So what we see here is that the dead, therefore, are unconscious. Now, I'm going to give you several verses that I want you guys to study. If one of my mods can put these in the chat, it would be great. But I want you to go study these verses and see what the Bible says. Because Job chapter 3, verses 13 through 19, it says, There the weary be at rest. So you're going to see that the rest comes. In Job 14, 7 through 15, Job 14, 7 through 15, it says that they're dead, not like sprouting trees. In Psalm 6, 5, Psalm chapter 6, verse 5, it says that in death there is no remembrance. In Psalm chapter 88, verse 11 and 12, it talks about the grave, the destruction, and the forgetfulness. In Psalm chapter 115, verse 17, it clearly says that dead do not praise the Lord. In Psalm 146.4, it makes it clear that his thoughts perish. This is why it says that the, the dead know nothing. It says, let the dead bury the dead. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 5 through 6, it says the dead know not anything. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10 says there's no knowledge in the grave. Isaiah 38 18 says the grave cannot praise thee. You hear so many people say well, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You're going to be in the in presence of God as soon as you die. It's not what Paul was talking about. You need to put it into context and really understand what Paul was saying when he said to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. Because if you look at the verse above, if you look at the verses above, it talks about being absent of the temple as well. Death is like unconscious sleep. Death is like an unconscious sleep. There's no knowledge of the passing of time. Death will not seem to last a moment longer to a person who has been dead 1,000 years than it will to one who has been dead one second. After a person has fallen asleep in death, his next conscious experience will be his standing before Christ. If he's a believer, he'll stand before Christ on the cloud of glory at the first resurrection. If he's a sinner, he'll stand before Christ, his judge at the last resurrection. And much time may pass between a person's death and his resurrection, but you are not going to have any knowledge of it. Us as believers do not need to fear to fall asleep in death because we have hope of resurrection to immortality. It's promised in the word of God either you believe the full word of God or you don't believe any of it you should not fear death because you have hope of immortality at the resurrection of Jesus Christ
So where do men go at death? Where do men go at death? What happens to men after they die? Do they go to, you know, a happy hunting ground? Do, do they fly away to dwell in some celestial mansion? Do they ride a ferry boat across the river Styx? Do they return to this world and become reincarnated in some animal or another person? Does, does some portion of man linger on earth to haunt the living or to converse with friends? Do dead men go to burning hell? where they're kept alive and tortured in inconceivable agony, agony for all eternity. Let me tell you what the Bible says. Let me tell you what the Bible says. That the dead do not go anywhere except to the grave in which they're buried. That dead men remain unconscious until the resurrection. So at death, men go neither to heaven nor to burning hell. They go to the grave. In John chapter 3, verse 13, we read, No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. No man except Jesus has gone to heaven. Paul, Peter, Mary are not in heaven. They are dead and buried in their graves, and they'll be resurrected when Jesus comes. When our Lord raised Lazarus from the grave, Lazarus was dead and buried in the tomb. He that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave cloths and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, loose him and let him go. John 11 verse 44. Where was Lazarus while he was dead? Was he in a burning hell? Was he in heaven or in the tomb? When Jesus cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth, he was not calling Lazarus to leave the celestial bless, bliss of heaven and come down to the earth. He was not calling for the soul of Lazarus to come up from the burning torture of hell and to go back into his decayed body. Our Savior was calling for Lazarus to come forth from the tomb where he was buried. I'm so tired of these pastors out here giving people false hope of saying, oh, your loved one's watching over you. Your loved one's doing this. Your loved one's doing that. Your loved one has no thought. Your loved one is laying in the grave until the resurrection. They have no consciousness. They have no thought. They're asleep. They're sleeping. How about David? Did David go to heaven? See, these are all things that you can, you can find the answers to if you just read the Bible. Did David go to heaven? Paul said, David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption in Acts chapter 13, verse 36. In Peter's Pentecost sermon, Peter said, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried in his sepulcher, is with us unto this day. Acts 2.29. Now, why would Paul say that if he was in heaven? Well, Paul said to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Well, why is Peter here saying that David's dead? Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 34. For David has not ascended into the heavens. If you just look at the word of God, you'll see that the Bible says that David never ascended into heaven. It's clear. He didn't go to heaven when he died. Those theologians who claim that Jesus took the dead Old Testament saints with him when he ascended to heaven should observe that the above statements were made by Peter and Paul after Jesus had ascended to God's right hand. Noah Abraham, Moses, David, Daniel, and all other ancient heroes of faith are dead and are waiting in their graves until the resurrection. Show me in the Bible something different. All dead men remain in their graves until the resurrection. The Bible is very clear that believers will be raised in the first resurrection at Christ's return. And they will be immortal and glorified. Sinners will stay buried in their graves until after Christ and the Christians raised in the first resurrection have reigned 1,000 years upon the earth. 
Sinners will then be raised mortal in the last resurrection. At that time, they will be judged. And if their names are not recorded in the book of life, they will be destroyed in the second death. Show me something different. All dead men remain in their graves until the resurrection. Men are not rewarded at the time of their death. Judgment is not at the time of death, but after death. Look at Hebrews 9, 27. Go to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Hebrews 9, 27. Now, who was writing Hebrews? We don't have a definite answer of who wrote Hebrews, but if you look at the literary style, you're going to see that it was probably Paul that wrote it. Look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It says this. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. After that. Right? After that to face judgment. So after death has ended, at resurrection to receive a reward, one must have knowledge. The dead, however, are unconscious. They abide in the unconscious sleep of death until resurrection. While a man is dead, he cannot experience joy, sorrow, pleasure, pain, reward, or judgment. Man must be resurrected so that he may receive his reward or his punishment. The dead cannot receive. Are you guys with me? Is this making sense? Is this making sense? The dead can't receive anything. Christians are not rewarded as soon as they die. The Bible's clear that they'll be rewarded at the resurrection when Jesus comes. At the resurrection, not death. Because the resurrection is the believer's hope. Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. Revelation 22, 12. Why would he say, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. What is the reward? The reward is the eternal life, the resurrection of the dead to immortality. Why would he say the reward is with them if we're already there? These are things that you have to ask yourself. When you're listening to all these other pastors that are telling you nonsense that don't line up with the word of God, you got to start asking them. Well, what, why is he bringing a reward if, if we're already with him? If we were already judged, why, why are we going to be judged after he brings the reward? But so many people just say, well, my pastor said that, so it's got to be true. My bishop told me that. It's got to be true. Nonsense. This is why you got to be in the word of God so that you know what's going on. The wicked are not punished at the time of the first death. They'll be judged after they're raised in the last resurrection and they stand before the judge, before the great white throne judgment. See, believers aren't going to stand before the great white throne judgment as a lot of pastors teach. The believer is going to stand at the Bema seat or, or the reward. This is why you'll see that their works will be tried with fire and those that remain will be rewarded. The, 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 the believer is going to be standing before the Bema seat or the, the reward seat. The Bema seat comes from the Greek at the Olympics where they had the first, second, and third, right? And they put the little, the little uh, crown on your head with the flowers and the vines all twisted. That's where that comes from, the Bema seat of Christ. The believer stands before the Bema seat of Christ, not the great way throne judgment. That's for the unbeliever at the second resurrection. All men alike lie down in earth and death to sleep together in the dust. In the two resurrections, however, each man will be raised to his own eternal destiny. Death is not the time of judgment. Resurrection is the time of reward and punishment. 
the believer is going to be rewarded for their works. Right? There's seven different crowns that you can earn in heaven. And I've done a teaching on it that there's seven crowns that the believer can earn. And those are the crowns that you will cast before the feet of Jesus. But you'll be rewarded. Be rewarded for your faithfulness. Amen. So you're going to have a time of reward at the Bema seat. And then the unbelievers are going to receive their punishment or their judgment at the great white throne judgment. And that's after we reign for a thousand years with them, with Jesus here on earth. <coughs> There's two deaths that are mentioned in the Bible. There's two deaths that are mentioned in the Bible. The first death is for all men. The second death is only for the wicked. The first death is temporary. The second death will be eternal. The first death will end in resurrection. The second death will never end. You see, the first death comes to all men alike. It makes no distinctions. All men, the righteous and the wicked, poor and rich, small and great, have to surrender to the power of the first death. If you look at Ecclesiastes 8, verse 8, I believe, it says there's no discharge in that war, talking about the death. Hebrews 9, 27 says that it's appointed unto man once to die. Job 3, 13 through 19, it talks about the small and the greater there, and that's talking about the death or, or the, 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 the grave that there's many there. So men die the first death because they are mortal. All men have come to the subjection of death, because of the result of Adam's sin. Even believers who have had all their sins washed away in the blood of Christ must die the first death. Men die the first death, therefore not in payment for their personal sins. If the death were payment of the penalty for man's personal sins, Christians should not die the first death. And the reason I say that is because your sins have been forgiven and they stand before God without condemnation. And what this truth begins to show us is that the need for the second death in which the wicked are going to pay for the penalty for their personal sin. That's when we get into the second death. That's where the wicked's going to be destroyed is in the second death. In the last resurrection, they'll be raised for judgment. You'll see that in Revelation chapter 20, starting in verse 10, going through verse 13. And it, talk, it says, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. In Revelation 20, verse 15. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Revelation 20, 14. But the fearful and unbelieving and the uh, uh, abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Revelation 21, 8. The lake of fire mentioned in these verses does not refer to any burning hell that exists today. It refers to the final destruction of the wicked after they have been raised to judgment. Because Jesus died as the believer's substitute so that the believer will not need to die the permanent eternal second death. The second death will have no power over believers who will be made immortal. Look at Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. It says this. It says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, and such the second death hath no power. Anybody out here teaching that your loved one's in heaven or hell is sadly mistaken. Any time that Jesus went, even when he went to Lazarus, he said that Lazarus was asleep. Right? He said, Lazarus sleepeth. And his disciples thought that he was sleeping. And Jesus had to correct him and say, no, he's dead. When he went to the little girl that he raised from the dead, he said that she was sleeping. You are asleep. The breath of life returns to God and your body returns to the dust. Immortality only comes at the resurrection. Dead cannot receive. Dead cannot receive.
I'm going to do a whole teaching. The original church kept the whole Torah sacrifices too. Acts chapter 21. The original church was still bouncing between Judaism and Christianity. The original church was still bouncing from between Judaism and Christianity. This is why Paul wrote so many letters to the churches because they were bouncing back and forth. I'm going to open the floor here in a second for um, any questions, comments, concerns. If you want to come up, we can discuss it. Um, but I'm going to do a whole teaching here leading into the, the four-part teaching that I did um, um, on theology, systematic theology. Um, so I'm going to do a whole teaching on this that leads into that so you guys will have a better understanding. So the breath of life is the spirit that returns to God, right? Yes, the breath of life is the spirit of God, right? So that is the breath of him that gave you life. I'm coming, Pastor Capulli. I'm coming. It's just going to take me a little bit. I've been out for a while now. I had pneumonia, and I'm actually still trying to recover from it. I'm not 100%. But if you guys got questions, feel free to ask them if you want to jump in the box. Jump in the box. Jump in the box. So the soul, it's the same thing, Louise. If you look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it says that man became a living soul, right? So your soul is that breath of life. Then you're given the Holy Spirit at, at the, the new creation. Not everyone has the Holy Spirit. You're only given the Holy Spirit at the moment of belief. That's why not everyone is a child of God, amen? That's another false teaching that out here is that everyone is a child of God. That's absolutely incorrect. You only become a child of God at the point of your belief. Is there any questions, guys? Anybody want to jump in the box? I love how they come in and drop a comment and then they leave because they don't want to hear the truth. So the soul that is judged, that is your soul. That's the living soul. So at the resurrection, the breath of God will return into you. That's how you become back to life, right? So the breath of God will return to you at the resurrection, whether it's the first resurrection for the believers or it's the second resurrection for the unbeliever. Remember, you you turn back to dust. How are you brought back? Well, dust is, has to receive the breath of life. <coughs> Good questions, though, Louise. Good questions. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Um, I'll be coming on tonight with Brother Carlos. I think we're going to have a little panel discussion and discuss some things. Um, it's been a minute since me and him have come on live together, so it ought to be interesting tonight. We'll see if we get banned or not, if we get bananaed. Usually when me and him get together, something. There we go. It takes time to get all this. No problem, Luis. Um, this is also going to be 